Hey everyone, this is Craig Palkey, the director of Ectotherms here at the San Antonio Zoo. And today we're taking you someplace that you guys don't normally get to see. Uh, this is our uh, Komodo Cool Room, otherwise known as our Mexican Montane Room. And this is our off exhibit area where it is not going to look like Mexico, or at least the mountains of Mexico, but year round it feels like the mountains of Mexico. And what we have in this room, it, it looks like just a bunch of aquariums. Um, that's to the uh, uneducated eye. Uh, but what we have in here is actually a, a lot of invested science in this one group of uh, reptiles here, uh, mainly focusing on montane vipers. Uh, so in this room, we have, besides a lot of aquariums, we have about 67 snakes. Most of them are in aquariums, so we got a few of the little, uh, the little kids in a rack system here. Um, out of those 67 snakes, there's 13 species total. 12 of them are vipers, 11 of them are rattlesnakes, and we have one type of garter snake in here that's also from the mountains of Mexico. So lots and lots of rattlesnakes in here. Um, I really like rattlesnakes. Uh, they're beautiful animals, got a lot of character. Uh, they're kind of mislabeled. A lot of people think rattlesnakes are bad. And when I take people in here, People look at these rattlesnakes and say, oh, these are cute babies. When are they going to grow up? Uh, well, there's lots of different types of rattlesnakes in the world. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head because I, I'm horrible with numbers, but there's quite a few species of rattlesnakes. They're all New World species, ranging from Canada all the way down to uh, Argentina, I believe. Um, maybe that's a little too far south, but down in uh, at least the upper half of South America. Uh, lots of different species of rattlesnakes. Some are quite large. In fact, one of the largest species is found in southeast United States, the eastern diamondback rattlesnake. You can get like eight, nine feet long. Um, these montane guys, though, they're a little bit more on the petite side. In fact, what you see here are, for the most part, adults. Just as I say adult, you're zooming in on one of my kids. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, uh, our kids are growing up pretty quick here. Um, this is one of our uh, juvenile New Mexico Originals rattlesnakes. I'm quite proud of these guys because they were born in 2016 and they were the first of their kind ever reproduced in captivity, at least here in the U.S. or North America. Very excited about that. It's an endangered species. They barely get into the heel of New Mexico. Got a bit of a bigger range in, in the actual country of Mexico, however. In fact, uh, the sibling over here, brother is uh, poking out, trying to get an idea what's going on. They actually can be a little curious. They're very cognizant of what's going on. But as far as that aggressiveness that rattlesnakes seem to have a reputation for, uh, they're really not very aggressive at all. I think that's a, it's a misused label for these guys. They can be defensive. Uh, they don't like people harassing them. Um, I don't uh, blame them for that. And I think they're actually kind of polite. They'll give you the warning. That classic rattle will let you know you're getting a little too close. So these guys in this room, why do we have them in this, uh, this room here that we call the uh, Mexican Montane Room? That's because where they live in the higher elevations, they actually live a cooler life. Unlike our western Dimeback rattlesnakes here in San Antonio area that can take the heat, these guys live up in the mountains and they enjoy cooler weather. And what we do in this room temperature wise is uh, we actually run an air conditioning unit year round. And we try to keep the temperature, the ambient temperature, no higher than about uh, 74, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And we let it get as low as the low 50s. It's affected a little bit by the heat lamps. So there is a little bit of fluctuation there. but. Uh, we're okay with that. In nature, there's a lot of fluctuations with weather, and I, I think it's actually good for them. It's enriching for them. So in the, in the winter time, it actually gets a lot cooler as we uh, cycle down the heat lamps. We don't run them as much, and it can get uh, quite cool in here. But year round, there is a nice uh, coolness to this room. In fact, it's, uh, it's a room that uh, my staff and I enjoy visiting come July and August here in San Antonio. It's a nice reprieve from the heat outside. And there's a lot of cool animals in there too. 
So I mentioned that there's a lot of science in this room. Uh, a lot of the husbandry w between the temperatures, uh, the photo periods, which we have two separate photo period schedules, one for the heat lamps and one for the ambient lighting. All of this is based on data taken from the field in Mexico. The San Antonio Zoo has been a longtime supporter of uh, Mexican montane reptiles, especially with them when it comes to the vipers and the rattlesnakes. Uh, we've been uh, working with colleagues down there or doing the field work ourselves for uh, many years. And uh, through that data and quite frankly, just the experience of going down there has helped us develop the appropriate husbandry to apply that in a captive situation. And what this has resulted in is uh, when it comes to zoos taking care of this uh, type of uh, reptile, the montane vipers from Mexico, um, San Antonio is number one. We do it the best. We uh, have reproduced many of the species we have in here. Uh, we, are, we supply other zoos with them that want to showcase these uh, beautiful animals in this unique habitat. Um, I'm not sure how to say it. San Antonio Zoo is number one with this uh, group of animals here. I do like that guy. That guy I call Mr. Green Jeans. He's a Corethran dusky rattlesnake and he's got this incredible greenish hue to him. And this species of rattlesnake is highly variable. Um, they're one of those box of chocolate rattlesnakes where uh, you could put a say a green male with a with an olive female and you can still get a whole variety of colors and one the pattern is always going to be the same but the, uh, the variety of colors could be slightly different. And if we had a feisty rattlesnake it's probably it's Corethrans. Um, we like to say they're the most honest and that's kind of a, our little jargon for uh, they're, they're a bit feisty they don't hide who they are and uh, if we're uh, work, spending a little too much time working with them, they'll, they'll get a little uptight with us, saying, time's up, move along. We do have several questions coming in, if you'd like a few of those. Sure. All right, let's go back. Uh, Jessica would like to know what they get fed and if you feed frozen mice. That's a great question. In captivity, we give them frozen thawed rodents. Um, reason I say frozen thought is sometimes when we just say frozen rodents, there's a misconception that we are basically giving rodent popsicles. Um, but we do get farm-raised rodents. Uh, they're, they, they get a great diet. We get very nutritious rodents for them. They're flash frozen. They get delivered to us. In fact, they come right from here in, uh, in the state of Texas. And when it's time to feed, we uh, figure out how many we have to thaw out and we thaw them out, get them the room temperature, and then most of these guys will take them uh, without, uh, they're not very finicky, most of them. Uh, we do have a couple, in fact you may have seen one earlier, that the, the mouse is still laying in there. That's with our uh, banded rock rattlesnake from Durango. And she's a little finicky, so we like to let her take her time. Cindy asks if we collect venom or anti-venom for hospitals. No, we do not. And there are very few places that actually do collect venom. Um, there's some places that say they do. And I'm not going to name names. We're going to keep this uh, positive. Um, but uh, if you ever hear places justifying why they do what they do with rattlesnakes because they collect venom, um, check into that. It's uh, not quite true usually. But there are a few places that do collect venom. For, the, uh, for all types of research, really. And uh, they have to collect it in a very sterile manner. They have to store it in a, in a very sterile manner. It's basically lab-like quality. Um, let's just say you can't just have a little uh, event at the Coliseum and start collecting it in jars. Um, we don't do that. We don't have the facilities. Um, and honestly, we got a lot of animals to take care of. I, I don't think we have too much time. It is a bit dangerous when you increase the frequency of which you are handling these venomous snakes. And when it comes to milking, it is truly handling with your hands. Um, you do risk the uh, chance of, uh, of getting hurt. So that's something we just don't, uh, 
partake in. Uh, we don't have a desire. However, there is a need for it out there for the folks that do it right, the laboratories that do that. Um, good things are coming from it. It helps with antivenin production. It also helps with uh, medical applications with humans. Um, I know a lot of people don't like venomous snakes because they're venomous. Um, I think we've got to change our tune a little bit because venomous snakes are the next pharmacological frontier. Uh, for instance, our copperheads found locally here, their venom is being studied for applications to help with the treatment, if not cure, of breast cancer. Uh, lots of venomous snakes throughout the world can help with stroke victims. Uh, it, it's a big frontier. Uh, these guys could be some of our best friends when it comes to medical applications that will help us directly. Are there any more questions, Kat? Yes, Jessica would like to know how you manage feeding. That is a great question. Uh, we do not hand feed them. <laughs> we have a lot of these cool tools here. I'm going to show you here. This is one of the world's largest tweezers. And we'll just uh, hold on to them and present it in front of them. We also have some uh, forceps here. We try and uh, set up staff to use uh, tools that are going to make them feel most comfortable and safe. Um, we have a great track record here with uh, safety and it had, a lot of it has to do with setting up my staff for success. Uh, if they're comfortable in doing their job safely, well, chances are it is going to get done safely. As long as we're here looking at tools, we've got a couple different types of hooks. Uh, because these guys are smaller, we got smaller hooks for them. Uh, this one is an all metal, in fact I believe it's all aluminum. Uh, this one's a little different, uh, it's a little bit lighter and it's got a polycarbonate tip to it. Um, some of these have a different feel to them, to, at least to the snakes. Sometimes it's a different feel even for the uh, person moving the snake. Uh, but the polycarbonate does not get cold. And this is very useful for some snakes because when you go to touch them, it's hard to tell if they're sleeping or not because they can't close their eyes. And so if you stuck a cold piece of metal and touched them and you want to hook them, and say they were in a very deep state of relaxation, uh, it makes them a little jumpy, makes them startled, and then you're kind of uh, in a position where possibly that snake doesn't want to cooperate with you as much. Uh, so these polycarbonate hooks are kind of nice in that they don't get cold and you tend not to startle your snake. So safer for me, a little bit more comfortable for my snake, and uh, I mean, no one likes to be startled. We got one more cool little tool here. <laughs> we call this the rock pickler. Uh, it was actually a tool, I believe, that came out of the, uh, the reef hobbyist trade. And uh, what we do, because these guys, we have them set up in rock piles, and sometimes they don't want to come out. Uh, so what we'll do is, this is very flexible. We can slide that in there, and then we just kind of rotate, get the hook, and we kind of nudge them out a little bit. Uh, so it's just one more little uh, cool tool we have. And I got some special gloves over here. <clears throat> Sometimes you just got to get in there and get those snakes out. And I got these special gloves here. They're called Hex Armor. Awesome gloves. Uh, we still also have uh, welding gloves, which can work out pretty well. But I found welding gloves to be difficult to use because I got pretty big hands. It seems like welder gloves don't come in extra larges. And uh, it's difficult having that dexterity to lift a heavy rock and not hurt my rattlesnake. Um, so we found these hex armor gloves, and they have several layers of this little cool little uh, hexagonal type plate on there. I'm not sure if you can get in there, cat. Mm -hmm. But there's, I believe, at least three layers of that. They overlap. Uh, they fit my big hands, and I got some dexterity, and I can actually lift the rocks and the most important thing is these are puncture proof especially for these rattlesnakes uh, these smaller species of rattlesnakes do not have large fangs even so these gloves have been tested with king cobras gaboon vipers uh, and they work really really well um, with that said uh, if need be i could actually pick up the snakes with these i've done it in the field in mexico with rattlesnakes and the crazy thing is every time i've had to pick up a rattlesnake with these gloves they never got defensive and never tried biting. So I don't know. I, sometimes I call these the magic gloves. They, uh, they're just wonderful to work with. 
So yeah, lots of different tools we have here. Uh, let's see here. This is one of our non-rattlesnakes here. This is an orange phase Mexican black-tailed viper. Very cool species found in southern Mexico, in the Huaca Puebla area. We've actually done really well with those. In fact, I have quite a few baby Mexican black-tailed vipers right now. Um, and in the coming months, we're hoping to start moving them to other zoos. We do have one species survival program rattlesnake in here. And everybody is hiding on me. Well, here's one here down here, Kat. The male that's checking you out. Chantel would like to know how long these snakes live. Well, I think we're still learning that quite a bit. That's data that we're constantly getting, and I believe, in general, they live between 15 to 20 years old. We do have some that have been getting up there in age. Um, trying to find, uh, like here we got, a, this is a beautiful one cat up here, before he, uh, he runs away. This is a Mexican pygmy rattlesnake, and he's a 10 year old. So he's kind of in his, in his prime, more or less. Beautiful snake. This is one of those that you don't see too much in captivity. And I'm pretty These guys got an interesting reproductive cycle in that their breeding season kind of runs simultaneous with their birthing season. The, uh, their, the breeding season will begin as early as the end of June and it can carry out sometimes as long as October. And they start giving birth as well around July and it can go as late as September and October. Um, so in July we start pairing everybody up. In fact, uh, when Kat gets a chance here, I can show you, if, uh, we actually keep a scoreboard because we have so many snakes, so many pairings. Uh, we keep track of who was with who. Um, this is basically Viper Dating 101 here. And uh, so we have our uh, the Obscures, our New Mexico Originals, our Southern Originals, uh, our Central Plateau Duskies, Armstrong Duskies, the Blacktails, Twin Spots, the Rongos, it goes on, and here's the Pygmies. And it shows when we paired them, who they were paired with. And uh, well, I got a little bit of lingo here too that my staff and I use. We have the letter L. And when you see that letter L, that means we had a confirmed Human identified the lockup. Um, that means that they were um, they were breeding. Um, pardon the uh, pardon the lingo, but uh, it's uh, I like seeing all these L's on here. It's very exciting. Um, this is our Mexican landslide rattlesnakes, the uh, species survival program species, and we did have one pair that we confirmed were locked up, and uh, this young lady here, Miss L fifteen one hundred one. Um, she's, if everything works out, she's going to be a first time mommy. And what's really cool is she comes from wild caught parents. So from a genetic standpoint with the SSP, this is a really important uh, uh, birthing here. So we're very excited and she's been showing all the signs. Um, I'm not sure if we have any mothers right now. The time of day is not the best. I know she was out. This is uh, the female New Mexico Originals rattlesnake. She actually was uh, out basking when we first came in. Uh, so we're hoping that she's gonna have babies for us. That'll be the second time for her. But what the moms will do is they get out and they, uh, the back one third of her body is starting to get pretty plump. Um, that's because that's where the babies are gestating. And uh, what they'll do is they'll stick that area underneath the heat lamp and thermoregulate in our terminology, we say they're cooking, and uh, they're just getting ready and letting those babies develop in them. And then come July, we might start to see some babies. They do not lay eggs, they're live bears. Um, so when you hear a herpetologist talk about Christmas in July, it has a completely different meaning. Um, we get very excited starting in July because we come up here and we're hoping to see little, 
little wiggly uh, baby rattlesnakes all over the tanks where the mommies are. We this? do have several more questions. Sure. If you want to go through that. Sure, go uh, right ahead. Sally would like to know if these snakes need exercise. Um, yes and no. Um, and that's one of the reasons we design their tanks the way we do. Uh, these guys like secure spots. Um, they don't travel great distances. Um, it's all about location to them. So we try and give them all their options within these aquariums. And uh, the heat lamp is a very focused spot. So we got a nice hot spot there. We try to give them a rock stack, which is something that gives them comfort. And those hiding spots in the rock stack actually give them more choice in, in uh, thermoregulating under the heat. And then, uh, I'm not sure what this girl's doing right now, but she's uh, something's got her attention to her left. So she keeps on going up and trying to go that way. But uh, they do need some room to move around and maintain their uh, fitness. Uh, but these guys are not to be confused with, say, like a garter snake or a species that covers more ground. If you like cat, I could show you a really special female that I'm excited about. She's the only female of her kind in a zoo in North America. And uh, we actually had to bring her a date from the Los Angeles Zoo. Gotta find the right key in my mini keys. How often do you feed the snakes in here? Well, that depends. Babies we will feed weekly. And then from there, it goes down to uh, a lot of the adults get fed every other week and in some cases like the black tailed vipers uh, the black tailed tail vipers they tend to uh, hold their weight <laughs> so we feed them at the most every three to four weeks so sometimes it depends on the species sometimes it depends on their age class but uh, <clears throat> most of them it's going to be around every other week so this is where my female Southern Originals rattlesnake is. Um, again, we have the only female in a North American zoo right now. And uh, she actually was a mother once, um, I think two years ago. And unfortunately her husband at the time, he uh, passed away from a kidney infection. He was getting up there in age as well. Um, so I contacted my friend at the LA Zoo who had two males, two very lonely males. So we did a little rattlesnake dating. So, I'm going to show you this uh, lovely girl here. Got my special gloves on. So if you look at her, you see where her head is. Just to the right of her head, you can see that part of her body is swelling pretty good. That's where the babies are. So we are very excited to see this mommy mommy to be and uh, that nice thickness back there because we got some uh, babies on the way if everything goes well now she's looking a little dull you can see her eyes are just slightly milky she's uh, getting ready to go through a shed cycle she's what we would call opaque at this point in that process of shedding it takes about 10 to 14 days they get dull and drab and in that process what's happening is uh, they're growing new skin underneath the old skin. And that's why you're getting that, that disconnect in color and the dullness and whatnot. And uh, the eyes get milky in the process because their, uh, their eye cap, the brill, is a scale in itself. And that's separating from the new one. And what's gonna happen after that 10 to 14 day period is those eyes clear up. And that usually means, okay, we're getting ready to shed. And uh, she'll start rubbing her nose on say the rock or even the substrate and uh, she'll break that seal that skin and then if everything goes well she'll just go right through it it's kind of like uh, if you're uh, if you got kids that wear tube socks and they pull them off and they uh, do it inside out that's what's gonna happen with the snakes except with the snakes we want that to happen and you will see every little scale you'll see certain patterns you'll even see the eye caps and what's cool about rattlesnakes, when they do shed, 
that's when they add another another section of their rattle on there. Rattlesnakes, you cannot age if you count the rattles. That is not a true indicator of how old they are. Um, basically, a new bead is, uh, appears every time they shed their skin. So it could tell you how many times they have shed, but even then that's not very accurate because it's kind of brittle and it can break off and then you don't have an accurate count from there as well. Crystal would like to know if they ever strike at each other through the enclosures. We have never seen that. Now where we do have multiple snakes together, every once in a while, and it's not just rattlesnakes either, we have had some other uh, species that uh, for whatever reason they had a disagreement when they normally uh, live in a very harmonious uh, situation. Um, I'd say in most cases it ends up uh, being a non-factor. When rattlesnakes bite, it, what happens after that depends on the scenario. Now if this, say this snake you're looking at right now is uh, located some food, of course it's going to strike at it and with that bite it's going to deliver venom. And that venom is useful in uh, subduing the prey. It actually starts to digest the prey from the inside out with those enzymes. Now, if, uh, say I'm walking on a trail and I find this rattlesnake and I startle it and it strikes out, there's a good chance it's going to uh, withhold its venom because venom is only used for its prey. At least that's the intention. It doesn't guarantee that I won't get a venomous defensive bite, but we've been learning through a lot of data, <laughs> through a lot of basically people getting bit, that uh, venomous snakes can deliver a dry bite which shows that they uh, have some restraint. And the reason they don't want to use it for a defensive bite is because that's wasting their resources. If they were to use that venom for every time they have to defend themselves, when a meal comes along, they may not have venom to help them get their meal. So I'm gonna cover her back up, let her relax. Do the babies stay in the same space with their mom? Uh, they tend to for a little bit. Uh, then they will disperse. That's actually something that's still being looked at with a lot of the rattlesnakes, uh, specifically. In fact, uh, some uh, some theories are out there that there's some maternal behavior. Uh, sometimes it's just uh, they haven't gone gone on their way yet. It's uh, there's a lot of different theories out there. Um, in fact, where they have seen a lot is like with timber rattlesnakes, which actually will go to a den. And uh, I'm not sure if that's part of the uh, process of learning that there's a den there so that they can come back for the next year when it comes to uh, brumation, their hibernation. Is there any other questions there, Kat? What would you recommend that people do if they were to ever encounter a snake out in the wild? Well, I think if you encounter a snake in the wild, um, First of all, enjoy the moment. <laughs> snakes are pretty cool. Uh, whether it's a rattlesnake, a garter snake, whatever, they're... But I'm a little biased. So uh, if you are an inexperienced person when it comes to snakes, I, I still recommend uh, being calm, um, enjoying the moment. Uh, don't do anything startling. Usually when folks do something startling, they uh, react poorly. And sometimes because of that, they put themselves in a position where they, they could have a confrontation. Uh, specifically, rattle, well, I guess you could say about all snakes. They don't want to be bothered by us. Uh, and rattlesnakes are no different. In fact, uh, you know, I mentioned rattlesnakes will rattle to let you know that they're there. That is actually not their first line of defense. Their first line of defense is to use their beautiful colors and patterns as a cryptic camouflage and they're really hoping you go right by them. And in many cases, we do. They're very good at not being seen. So that's their first line of defense. If you do see them and they know you see them, then they're gonna to start to rattle. And that's still okay. That doesn't mean death is upon you. Um, that means keep your cool, uh, make sure you know where that snake is and, and give it a wide berth. And if you give it a wide berth, they'll be very appreciative. They'll probably actually start going in the opposite direction. 
They may still stare at you with their head arched up and the tail going off, but if you watch, a lot of times they will just keep on going backwards and they're trying to get away from you. They're not fast snakes, uh, but nevertheless, they still want to get away from you. And if you give them that wide berth, they will gladly take it and appreciate it. And at the end, you had a great experience with some wildlife and you couldn't be any safer. Is it true that there are ways to tell the difference between a venomous and a non-venomous snake just by visually looking at them? Yes, and it has to do with identifying them. <laughs> a lot of people like to go with uh, triangular heads and stuff like that. Um, that's not really good, it's not really safe. Um, the best thing you can do is, like, say you live in the San Antonio area here, um, learn what your native wildlife is. For one thing, you're, you're just going to be smarter and be able to enjoy and appreciate your native wildlife better. Uh, in the case of snakes, it might give you a better peace of mind. In fact, uh, there's a lot of great books out there, but one of the coolest things I've seen that's available to um, the everyday person is uh, in the checkout lane at HEB. They got those little laminated uh, trifold cards, and they got ones for identifying birds, um, insects, butterflies. Uh, they actually have one for snakes. In fact, I keep one in my Jeep for... Uh, Snakes of Central Texas that I got from HEB. That's a handy little guide, and uh, it'll help you out if you're having trouble memorizing your uh, your native snakes. Are they immune to their own venom? I don't believe it affects them at all, at least not like the prey items. Now, in fact, uh, if they do uh, bite each other, uh, there's usually not much effect to that. Any other questions, Kat? Candace is asking if it is true that snakes should be fed in a separate container from where they are living in their habitat. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, different ideas behind that. I think it depends on situations. Um, the majority of our snakes get fed in their home enclosures, and uh, we don't see any negative reactions to that. I think where a lot of that comes about is uh, when people have pet snakes, uh, there might be an association with uh, whenever the enclosure is being opened, that usually means food's coming. Um, sometimes I can see how that theory would work. Um, I've never done it with my snakes, whether it's at home or at the zoo here. Um, I haven't had that problem. So it's something that we don't do. Now, if we have, uh, say a couple snakes living together in one enclosure and one of them is a vigorous eater while the other one uh, for lack of better description plays with its food uh, we'll separate them at that point but that's more a strategy to give the uh, give the pokey eater um, a chance to eat its uh, food in in peace and not have its meal stolen from it Cat, if you get a chance, right down here, we have this beautiful male central plateau dusky rattlesnake. It's right down here. You know, we talked about uh, montane snakes um, living in the mountains, but uh, we didn't talk about just how high up in the mountains these guys can be found. Um, this particular one, out of all of our snake, our rattlesnakes here, the montane rattlesnakes that is, this guy can be found at the highest elevation. Uh, these guys can be found over 14,000 feet up. Um, it's the equivalent of Mount Rainier in Washington. If you've ever been there, and I know that's a big mountain. Uh, this particular one is found in the central plateau area of Mexico and the elevations there. And uh, uh, it's just amazing to think that they're found up that high. Uh, it's, in, it's incredible that you know, we think of reptiles that we think of tropical places, very warm places. And while they do need some heat to thermoregulate, they get that from the sun by basking. But it's amazing how, uh, how mobile these guys are, even when it cools off. They're, uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's, it's something that still amazes me, even though I've been working with these guys for almost eight years. I 
got another little rattlesnake here coming to check me out. These guys are so alert. Yeah, he's reaching out to see me. This is a banded rock rattlesnake. Almost all of our banded rock rattlesnakes come from Zacatecas, uh, the, the Mexican state of Zacatecas. And uh, these guys are found in a couple of Mexican states. And what's really interesting is there's some slight differences depending on their locale. And uh, the males are dimorphic from the females with this species in that the, the males will have very clean bands that, uh, in fact, he hasn't gotten, he's a young one. He was born in 2017 and he still hasn't gotten his full adult colors, but the light colored banding will eventually turn like a, like a minty green. It's an incredible color and it's so clean they look like plastic snakes. Now the females in that banding, they're going to have some speckles and models. Still a pretty snake, uh, but looks vastly different from this guy. Now where they tend to vary, um, my partner down in Mexico in his lab, he actually has the same species of rattlesnake, but they're from Sierra Fria in the state of Agos Calientes. And instead of having that minty green band, uh, they have more of a powder blue. So there's a little variance from their range. And what we try to do is we are very particular. We like to stick with our particular locales. We do have one female Durango locale banded rock rattlesnake, and we wouldn't want to match her up with, uh, say, one of the males from Zacatecas. I'm trying to keep things, uh, I guess for a lack of a better word, pure. <laughs> Would we, it be normal for them to interbreed with species unlike their own? There is the potential for hybridization. And the reason why, say, we're not going to mix a, a Durango with a Zacatecas is because some of the taxonomy is still being worked out. There might be some differences, and they actually could end up being different subspecies or different species, and we just want to want to mix that up. Um, but in the wild, there are some uh, some of my friends that work down there and live down there. They have found some what look to be intergrades. There's uh, one in particular that uh, looks like a cross between a Tamalipan rock rattlesnake and a Coretran dusky rattlesnake. Uh, so there is the possibility. Since we can control things here, uh, we're going to do our best to not, uh, not create uh, abnormalities. Kim would like to know if they can get ticks. Yes, they can get ticks. They can get ticks, they can get mites. Um, I've actually seen mosquitoes on rattlesnakes. Um, so they, they can get all kinds of external parasites. Uh, ticks are probably one of the more common I've seen on, uh, on snakes. Mites would be a close second though. They also get internal parasites. Uh, they can get all kinds of goodies inside them as well. And that's why, uh, when we get new snakes here, they go through a quarantine process to make sure that, uh, if they did bring anything in, we can uh, treat that. And uh, even while they're living here, they get um, they get health checks by our excellent vet staff, and uh, we send in fecals to see if they got any test internal parasites. Um, staff does a great job of uh, checking on them for external parasites as they look at them daily. Melissa would like to know how they drink water. That's an excellent question. They actually will stick the tip of their mouth in, in the water and they will start to, to suck it up. Uh, you can actually see the uh, pumping motion in their throat. They'll, uh, they'll, they'll, they're drawing up water that way. Um, some of these guys, uh, they uh, will drink in a different way though. Um, some of these locations where these snakes are found, uh, there's not a lot of standing water. Um, there could be rivers and things like that, but in many cases there's not much standing water unless there's a heavy rain and some puddles formed. Um, but there is a lot of, uh, a lot of fog, they'll get dew, and they'll get little dew droplets on their body. And uh, what we do daily in here to add some humidity and also give potential drinking, uh, uh, give, them a, give them an opportunity to drink this way is we spritz them with water 
And then when the droplets form on some of them, some of them will drink right from their body, those droplets of water. Marianne would like to know if there's a specific time of year that snakes shed or if it is only for when they get larger. Yeah, shedding skin is, is really a function of growth. It's not a seasonal thing. Um, if, uh, if a snake eats a lot and the quality of food is, is good and there's growth, um, they will shed more frequently. Um, snakes will also shed to heal. Uh, so if they have uh, some type of sore, say if they had a, some type of uh, cut because they got into something, um, a lot of times when I've, I've seen this happen, uh, a couple days later, the snake will go into a, a shed process. It'll go opaque. And what I'll do is start growing that new skin. And when it sheds, um, you'll see some of the healing process. That wound will not be as, as large as it was previously. But primarily it has to do with, uh, with, with growing. Dusty would like to know if there was a timber rattlesnake. At the saw. zoo here? Um, we, we do have three timber rattlesnakes here at the zoo. And it is actually a species native to the eastern part of Texas. In fact, uh, the closest spot to San Antonio where you could possibly find a timber rattlesnake is uh, Palmetto State Park. It's about, uh, about an hour's drive east of here. Timber rattlesnakes happen to be one of my favorites. I've been able to participate in field work with them in Wisconsin. Uh, they have quite a range uh, from eastern Texas through uh, central United States up to Wisconsin and stretching into Canada all the way up into the, the northeast and then uh, back down into the southeastern United States. Any other questions, Kat? Do these guys eat other snakes out in the wild? No, in fact, uh, if uh, these guys in general, if they had one prey item in common, it's probably going to be lizards. Uh, in the wild, they eat a lot of lizards. That's tough for us to replicate here because we like to keep our lizards. Um, but we, uh, I guess you could say we've more or less convinced them to eat rodents. But uh, as far as snakes go, uh, these guys are not snake eaters, not like a king snake or like a king cobra. Chris is asking how many rattlesnakes are there total in the state of Texas? I'm not sure if he means numbers or types. Uh, it's probably, uh, well, there's no way I could tell you how many individuals. <laughs> so we'll go with species, and even then, uh, I'd have to almost say them out loud here. Um, we got western diamondback rattlesnakes. We got prairie rattlesnakes. We got Mojave rattlesnakes. There's desert mass saga. There's timber rattlesnakes. Um, there are uh, eastern blacktail rattlesnakes. Uh, there's mottled rock rattlesnakes, and there are banded rock rattlesnakes. In fact, we do have two species of uh, montane rattlesnakes here in Texas. They're found in the western part of the state where we have uh, where we have mountains. I have not seen a banded rock rattlesnake in uh, Texas yet, but I did find a couple of the mottled rock rattlesnakes. One of them at uh, literally at the top of Emory Peak in Big Bend and another one in the Davis Mountains. Um, beautiful, beautiful snakes. But uh, if you want to see some of those, you gotta, you got to head up into the mountains. Zia would like to know if any of them have names. Um, <laughs> outside of Mr. Green Jeans, which is just my little nickname for that one guy, we don't seem to have names for these guys. It's, we have 67 snakes in here. And I'm going to be really honest. It's, it's tough to find all those names and uh, it's a little, it, it's not as rewarding because they don't have ears so they don't really respond to those names very well anyways. Eunice pointed out that under this little guy's head, she thought it looked like an injury but is asking if it's just a red spot and I'm noticing that the other two banded rock rattlesnakes also have a pink or reddish color underneath their chins. I'm going to see if he'll show that to me. That looks to be a scale abnormality. And it's kind of interesting that uh, that, that, that was noticed. 
to be honest. I don't spend a lot of time seeing the undersides of their throats there. Um, that just looks like a scale abnormality. And I think the other ones that you saw it, I'm looking at their numbers, and I believe they all came from the same litter. So that may be some type of scale abnormality that's uh, genetically uh, inherited. What it means, I'm not sure. In fact, the only thing I can think of that was similar to that was a totally different type of snake, the Dumeril's boa. It's a large, beautiful boa from uh, Madagascar. And when they started being reproduced in captivity in a very close spot, similar to that, except more in the middle of their throat, uh, they always had uh, a couple of scales that were abnormal. Just uh, off color instead of the creamy white. And that was actually kind of indicative that uh, they came from this one line of captive produced dumeral boas. So long story short, um, I think it's just a scale abnormality. Really should not be anything that hurts them, harms them. You can see those ventral scales have got all kinds of patterning on there. Uh, maybe something similar just uh, localized in, that, in those throat scales. I'm not sure if our viewers can hear. I think this little guy woke up his friends because they're all moving around. But oh. if you can hear his rattle. This one up here is video. doing quite a bit. Like this would be a great time to get some footage here. You can see how quickly that vibrates. And that's what it is, it's vibrating. Um, you know, it's called a rattlesnake, sounds like a rattle, uh, but it's not really a rattle in the true sense. Um, what they are is they're modified scales that are connected onto each other. Um, it's kind of hard to describe, but uh, they, they, they can't just slip off those, each one of those little sections, but they are loosely held on. And just by the tail vibrating so quickly, they uh, rub on each other and create that rattling noise, but the, there isn't actually like little pieces of something inside there, like a true rattle, say like a baby's rattle. Pretty cool to get to see that. I just, when they go off, I, uh, I like to refer to it as the rattlesnakes are singing. <laughs> All right, folks, well, I think we're gonna we're going to conclude this little trip into our uh, Montane Rattlesnake Room. Hope you guys enjoyed this uh, sneak peek. I think it's pretty cool, especially because this isn't on exhibit, even when the zoo is open. Um, we do have some of our Montane Rattlesnakes on exhibit in the Reptile House, though. We have some special rooms that maintain the temperature and allow you to get to see several of our species there, along with some of our Montane Lizards as well, the Alligator Lizards. So. When we reopen, and we can't wait to reopen, we hope to see you guys come back here and uh, see us. Come in the reptile house and check out our Montane uh, Mexican reptiles there. In the meantime, uh, stay connected with us. We have several different formats on social media. We're doing these chats several times a day, uh, keep you guys connected. And actually, it, it gets us excited because we love sharing our animals. And uh, it's, it's tough for us in that aspect as well, being closed. So. Uh, keep on following us. We love sharing with you guys, and we hope you guys enjoy seeing these. Um, and if you guys can find your heart and have the ability to help us out, please do so. We're a private nonprofit institution, and uh, this shutdown is really hurting us because when we don't have our doors open and we don't have people coming, uh, we have no revenue to help take care of our animals. So um, please look at different ways to donate if you're interested. Uh, on our zoo website and uh, we'd appreciate any help we can get from you. In the meantime, we'll see you back here when we're open. Thanks for joining in.